I, I remember there was something like the police officer was like, look, if I see somebody running down the street with a gun as an officer, I have to pursue it. They were like, how dare you not take the person's race into account and think maybe you shouldn't follow that person because of Run oppression. With a gun. I mean. Welcome to The Black Sheep. We're a publication that highlights important but unpopular perspectives and fights for a culture that values hearing out those perspectives. We are going to be talking to the guest author of one of our most popular essays yet, Kevin Ray. He's a theater director who has had personal experience with some of the most crazy stuff that I've heard about social justice activism in the arts. So we're very excited to get more in depth with his perspective, his experience on this. I wanna to talk to you about advice that you would give to other artists that are experiencing this. We wanna talk about the uh, parallels between your experience with Westboro Baptist protesters and social justice activists and a lot of other very interesting things that are gonna be particularly useful to people who are in the arts. So if that's you, stick around because you will know some of this, but you have no idea how bad it can get. And being able to hear from someone that has navigated these kinds of groupthink and regressive mindsets in the arts is a really valuable way to figure out how you might do that if you meet these kinds of authoritarian mindsets in your own artistic journey or elsewhere. So let's pass it over to, do you want to do, oh, let's, let's, who are we? Who are we? I'm Salome Simone. I'm a co-founder at The Black Sheep and a writer and artist. And this is... Jay Klein, co-founder of The Black Sheep. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've known Kevin for a long time. We worked together a little bit when uh, I was at the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. Um, I went to uh, your play, The Machine Stops, which was just absolutely incredible. Um, and so I'm so excited to have you here. So first of all, Kevin, uh, ev not everybody watching this might have read your article yet. Can you just summarize quickly for us, like, what is your story? What happened? What have you seen? Um, it's hard. It, it's hard to sum up. And you know, I'm like, this. I, I'm like the worst at this. I'm like, how yeah. do you give like a quick blurb, like two set of what it is? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the article, take your time, take your time. The article was about um, what was what has been my experience as someone who works as both a teaching artist and who works as a theater director. How do those two fields connect? How is one feeding off on the other? And then what has happened since critical social justice activism has become really ingrained in both of those fields? Okay, what is critical social justice? We should probably define that. I mean, the, the more colloquial term is wokeness, but that's a, that's a controversial term. It's less specific. Um, not everybody necessarily means the same thing uh, when they say it. So, so what is this critical social justice um, movement that you witnessed uh, gaining popularity within the theater ecosystem? Well, in the article, we made sure to put in a link to... Um, Helen Pluckrose and her definition of it, because I think she, to me, at least Helen Pluckrose has been able to come up with the best definition of what it is. Essentially, you know, my understanding is we're talking about what started as an academic field that was looking at what is the role of power, who has power, how do they get it? And then they're attaching it to all these identity groups. So who's wielding power by race? Who's wielding power by sex or gender? who is wielding power by sexual orientation. And then they're coming up with this whole matrix of how it functions and how it's harming people and what people have to do to intervene in this power struggle. Um, one of the authors who cited frequently is Paolo Freire, who wrote a book called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, largely from his experience working with adult language learners, but looking at how education is throwing off power imbalances and how can learners get more power, how can we use education to 
make the learners aware that they are being oppressed by the culture. It's flattening everybody into either oppressors or the oppressed. And so once we use education to raise their consciousness to understand that they are being oppressed, then they will stage a revolution and then they will become the oppressors and repeat the whole pattern all over again. So it's very dark. Um, <laughs> he's not the only um, person who might be associated with critical social justice. There are many. You could do a whole podcast episode on just what is person X's understanding of what critical social justice is. Um, but maybe for our conversations, it would just be sort of the the idea of, of, of looking at everything through the lens of some kind of power and making a lot of assumptions based on identity about who has power and that they're wielding it in a harmful way. And how, how do we take that power away from them and restore what we think is some kind of justice? I don't know. Is that your understanding of it? Yeah, I'd say that's basically my understanding of it. Um, you know, I know that the term critical social justice, there's a lot of people uh, lumped into that philosophy um, correctly, but it's kind of, it, it can sometimes be a post hoc definition of a lot of different strains of thought that went into it. So critical race theory, um, many different types of critical studies, um, uh, gender studies, uh, feels like that. Um, I know one of the people that actually defines themselves as critical social justice, which is why Helen used that word uh, or that term was Robin D'Angelo. So Robin D'Angelo, for those that don't remember, uh, the author of uh, the book White Fragility. And that's basically the, the same school of thought as people write, remember the Smithsonian graphic for the African American History Museum that, you know, thankfully got retracted, but it, it said things like... Um, Being on time is yeah, white supremacy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that these are signs of, of white culture, right? So so I think the... Uh, one thing, if, if you um, were going to sh show that infographic, and then put it next to the same uh, picture of what happened with the New York City Department of Education. Because mm -hmm. Carranza had a slide that was the exact same stuff that they were using in teacher training. So you see how it's not just something that's being put up at a, at a museum for people to see. It's actually making its way into professional teacher training. Yeah, so that's a great point. So that's something I really want to talk to you more about. Just to finish the point on like on what this um what this viewpoint is, is it basically it looks at everything in terms of oppressor oppressed dynamics and it doesn't it takes the status quo, not as there that there's any reason why culture might develop the way it is. It's all arbitrary, it's all socially constructed. And so you can say things like, you know, valuing being on time for something, that that's just totally arbitrary and we could organize our society in a way that doesn't care about things like that. And so we're making a choice, you know, by organizing our society that way. You know, I think that's ridiculous. Um, I think, obviously, again, being on time is just such a great example. There's so much more on that chart, and we, we will throw it up on screen. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously, that's something that matters. We can't work together if we're not places on time. Um, so, you know, I know that, uh, you, you know, you wrote about in your article um, having to, or, or you didn't go ahead and teach it, but you were asked to teach this stuff in schools. So what happened and what was that like? Did you ever see anybody like actually giving this information to kids in a school? And what did that look like? Are, are the kids buying it? I mean, I think that's just so scary for the next generation. Well, I mean, there's a couple things in there. One of, one of them has to do with why I got into teaching in the first place. And it was because it was fun and exciting and it was working with young people and their teachers introducing them to theater oftentimes you know they had never had a theatrical experience in their life like some of them are as young as kindergarten but sometimes they get all the way up into high school and they've never created a scene they've never acted anything out before there's so many fun things to do with theater that has to do with how can we work together as a group to make something and then present it back to an audience 
And that thing that we can make, it might be 45 seconds long, but we made a plan for what we were going to do. We had fun making it. We set a goal of presenting it for an audience. And then we presented it in front of an audience and we were successful doing something we've never done before. Um, or it was things like, how can we all pretend to be ducks and go on a duck adventure? How can we all um, sing a song together and perform it? Um, there's a lot of value in that. There is absolutely no reason to push that aside and then use the theater workshops as an activity that masks what it is that we're really trying to do, which is introduce you to concepts from critical social justice. Um, and it, there was a, a lot of debate at one point when um, critical race theory was in the news a lot. And everyone would say things like, they're not doing critical race theory in classrooms. They're not doing that. That's a legal theory. How could they even possibly be doing it? Well, they're not teaching critical race theory, but they might be doing critical race theory. So if part of my lesson plan is at a certain point, I'm going to do a theater activity and I'm going to separate them by race and then have them do the activity in different racial groups. Well, that's criti That's doing critical race theory in the classroom. I didn't, I, I never saw that, but that did happen in my professional teacher training. I went to um, a workshop where we were being every fall, all the organizations that get the entire staff together. Part of it is just to kick off, hey, welcome back, everybody from the summer. Part of it might be introducing us. Maybe the Department of Education has, you know, some new um, initiative or something, and we're going to use the arts to support that. Um, but this one particular, this was the fall of 2019. They decided to segregate us by race in terms of, uh, they call it racial affinity groups. So they put this smiley face on it. Oh, it's a racial affinity group. But they're segregating staff by race. So if they're doing that to the adults, that's going to filter down into the classroom. If you're telling the adults that's okay, and we should be doing this, and we should be thinking about our race all the time, that's going to make it into the lesson planning. The word that they use all the time is we want to embed these practices. So you won't be able to notice them on the faith, if so, you know, and it's things like starting the workshop with, you know, getting all the middle schoolers in a circle, having them all say their name and their pronouns. I was doing a Shakespeare workshop. This was right before, um, it was right before summer. I think it was in 2022. Um, and I had been working with middle schoolers. We were doing Midsummer Night's Dream, not the whole play. We were doing like little snippets and scenes from it. So I had known these young people for a couple of weeks. I had, I think, three different middle school classes. It was over in Queens. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew most of their names, but I was getting an observation. So my supervisor came in and she said, oh, are you going to put them in a circle and have them go around and say their names? And she's like, and what about pronouns? And then I turned to the teacher. I said, uh, I said, well, you're the classroom teacher because I'm we're visitors from an arts institution. I said, you know, are pronouns something that you normally do at the school? And the teacher goes, well, sometimes they do them, sometimes they don't. So then, of course, my supervisor makes all these middle school kids go around the room and say their name and their pronouns. And I did observe, I could see that there was one young person in that class who was showing gender nonconformity. Hey, that's fine. This is a middle schooler. This person's 11 or 12 years old. Let them live their life. Let them explore. Let them do whatever. But why are we turning this theater workshop now into something where we're all going to be super conscious of our pronouns and that young person's pronouns? These are the ways in which they, quote, embed this stuff because their idea, and it's, again, in, the reason why I think critical social justice is a good name is because they are after getting justice. They think this is justice and is justice to not telling you as a parent what I'm going to do in the theater workshop. I'm just going to go and I'm going to do it because I think I know better than these young people's parents that they need to be really focused on their name and their pronouns right at the beginning.
It would be one thing if as a teaching artist, I said to the, to the students, Hey everybody, um, we're meeting for the first time. I just want to get a chance to hear everybody's name. We're going to go around the room and I want you to introduce yourself in any way that feels comfortable to you. I could leave it at that, but it's the compelling people to participate in what I would call gender ideology, which is a subset of critical social justice, which is the belief that you have a gendered soul inside your body. Like, it seems like it's very simple, right? But actually it's transmitting through the theater workshop an entire worldview that nobody asked for. They asked for Kevin to come in and work with their middle school kids on a Midsummer Night's Dream. And that's what Kevin was doing until his supervisor showed up. Mm-hmm. And then when you want to ask them questions about like, why are we doing this? You get a lot of pushback and a mm-hmm. lot of anger. Mm-hmm. And then you get the name calling, racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, this. I mean, this type of behavior is off the chart. Not anything I would call professional. Mm-hmm. One great sign of change, and we might, maybe I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. But I don't know if you saw the Atlantic magazine, Thomas Chatterton Williams interviewed a Pulitzer Prize and Tony winning uh, Broadway composer named Michael R. Jackson. Mm. And in that article, he talks about the absurd behavior and how bad it is. <laughs> so it's going to come out. Yeah. Maybe some of us were early to say, but it is going to come out. And sadly, these people have left a trail behind on the internet, whether it's you know videos or memes or news articles. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that people are starting to realize how pervasive this is and just how pernicious it is. And I think it's great that you brought up how much there was pushback against the idea that these these concepts were being pushed in grade schools and on young people. There was all this um, basically just straight up gaslighting. This is not happening. You are lying. You are trying to push an agenda yourself by saying that someone is trying to push an agenda. But now the proof is there for anyone who wants to see it. And your story is so fascinating because you have seen it firsthand in multiple ways. So in education, as well as in the arts, which I'd like to talk about um, that side of your experience as well in the theater. What happens when, again, that same mindset that I am justified in pushing my singular worldview on everyone else because I am morally righteous. And if you oppose me doing my morally righteous actions of pushing this ideology, I will use every means necessary to submit you to it. So you've seen people be canceled. You've seen struggle sessions on stage. You've been told to simply step aside and let other people have their chance, which I find is uh, one of these great examples of how good intentions can create mass destruction. I've had people tell me also the same idea that, well, isn't it time that some other races or some other sexes get a chance? As if there's something noble in telling people that they should give up on their life's dreams simply because of their identity. Maybe people that haven't had a chance should have a chance. And, you know, any individual is not like the statistical representation of people who have had a chance within a within a group. So whole thing is just crazy. And your story is particularly inspiring because you start out the essay with an injury that could have prevented you from ever even walking on a stage. And now here you are being told that you should give up on your dream that you fought for very hard for a very long time against different groups of people who have told you to stop from Westboro Baptist to now social justice activists. And you've persisted through all of these obstacles um, to live your dream and to pursue the artistic career you want nonetheless. So um, I, I, there's so many threads that we could go through. I'd love if you give a little bit of background on your experience uh, having a play, a performance 
uh, boycotted or protested by Westboro Baptist protesters and the similarities that you've seen between what we openly recognize as a hate group and what these kind of social justice activists would think themselves nowhere near. And yet your experience shows the similarity. And in some cases, it's the critical social justice activists who go much further than the Westboro Baptist protesters dared to. It's hard to describe what the world was like mm -hmm. in the 90s because things have changed so dramatically, particularly for gay men and lesbian women. I mean, so dramatically. Um, I've been recently watching, I don't know if you've ever seen this TV show. There used to be a television show that was on for a long time. It was called Law and Order. I'm familiar. If you watch the first, have you ever seen Law and Order? I think so. There's many different oh, kinds. Of course, yeah. Right. So the original Law and Order, right. and if you were to watch episode, uh, seasons one through five, those programs, are they're so great because they're teaching you about how our justice system works, but they're also showing you, you go back and watch it now, and you can see what how society has changed. Mm -hmm. So the things that they're talking about or, you know, some of the ways society is exactly the same as it was then. But I was just watching an episode that the the central conceit had to do with um, a gay city council person and the anger that um, was being drummed up by uh, somebody who was on the other side of the aisle and how that person would mobilize their base and how it was totally fine to in public you know, slander somebody for being gay. The fact that, you know, in the mid nineties, being an out gay uh, city council person would have been like almost unheard of. Like that would have been, you know, really risky thing to do. Um, so when this thing happened with the Westboro Baptist church for people who haven't read the article, I was in a tour of a musical that went around the country and that musical happened to have characters in it who were gay, and it talked about some of the struggles that they have, um, particularly working in the arts. And Westboro Baptist Church heard about our show, and so when we played a theater in Kansas, they were outside the theater holding signs that says, God hates fags, two gay rights, AIDS, and hell, so that when our bus pulled into the theater parking lot, we drove past them and you know, then we got up. And so, but I should partly say that, you know, that might sound outrageous now at that time, that wasn't entirely on, it didn't happen all over the place, but the fact of it happening wasn't like, oh, this is shocking and surprising. Like a lot of people just really weren't comfortable at that time. Um, so, you know, we got off the bus, we went backstage. It was it was really scary because we were going to go out in front of an audience and we didn't know what they were going to do. We didn't know if they were just going to stay outside holding the signs or were they going to come into the theater? And then what are we going to do if we're on stage performing this show and they're in the audience yelling or if they're in the audience and they throw something at the stage, what are we going to do? And then, you know, the 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 aspects of being ashamed, you know, that, um, yes, a lot of us are gay and you're criticizing us just because of who we are. You're saying who we are is bad. You know, you have this thing that goes on in your head is why are people in society saying we're bad just because of, of who and, and, and what we are. Um, you know, that, that takes a, a, a toll on your brain. You know, you really start to question like, no, they're, their behavior is unacceptable. There's there's nothing wrong with us. And we should be proud to go on stage tonight and, you know, do our show, which is what we did. We went on with the show. They didn't stop us. Um, what I said in the article is that I wonder if that their activism, which I think was intended to turn people off, to get people to walk away, I think what they did was they actually deepened the meaning of the play because the people going to the show who may not know anything about what it's like to be gay or lesbian, but if they had to walk by these people holding signs saying awful things and then come in and watch a show 
where not the entire part of the show, it was, you know, a small part of the show, but it did address these issues. They're going to understand those issues differently because they just saw it and they, they just experienced it firsthand. Yeah, I think that's a really great part of uh, your essay. And it's something that's unique about good art is that it has this interplay with the world. And so negative things that are happening in the world, if you make art that's true and and is not trying to push something false, but actually relates to the world in a real way, you end up with those kind of like moments of beautiful spontaneity where really you could imagine a play today that would do that on purpose. Hire actors to be protesters, to give that off the stage sense for the audience of what it's like to be in that position of someone that you are this minority population facing all this hatred. Um, but what's unique about that story is that you've gotten it from two different angles. So not just the uber conservative Westboro Baptist protesters, but you've gotten it from the uber radical leftist social justice uh, activists. So I think something that really stood out to me was just the, the kind of like power plays that recurred throughout your experience in theater. Um, I know you've spoken about um, I, I believe it, she was a theater director that was that she resigned under so much pressure. Um, oh, that was an executive director. Yeah, an executive director. Right. And her story is particularly gripping. Um, there seems to be this desire to find people that can become targets so that you can do social justice activism at them. And so there's this division that happens within the the arts world and, and theater as, as you've experienced where either you're with us or you're against us. And I, I think one of the things that's just so different is that, you know, when the Westboro Baptist Church wanted to say horrible things at your play, they were doing more speech, right? Like you just said, they didn't right. go in and stop you. When it's the critical social justice people doing it, it's not just that they want to be heard, it's that they don't want to you to be heard and that's a major difference and and you know i'd love to hear about how that's manifested well i think it's important to think about two different groups of players in this because you have the the hardcore activists who are really pushing it and then you have a whole bunch of people who are enabling them either because they're not sure what's right or wrong or they're also afraid or they want to play a game of, well, they have a point and, you know, or, well, they're just young. And in that way, they're complicit in this behavior. So in not standing up and saying, wait, hold on a minute, folks. This is not the right way to resolve this issue. They say nothing. Or... They start, they get confused. It's interesting the people I talk to who are from the baby boomer generation who actually lived through the 60s, sometimes they are very confused about what this is because they will say things like, well, you know, I lived through an activist moment in the 60s and it was a really great thing and mm -hmm. I just don't understand why this is different. Like this, they will acknowledge this is different, but they can't put their finger on why it's different and why it's not okay. So the two groups that I see are there are the hardcore activists and then there are the enablers who are enabling for a variety of different reasons, whether it's out of fear, whether it's out of they want to be an ally, whether it's they they think they're going to get an opportunity as well. And so then this very small group gets an outsized advantage on what they're able to do and you know, since I crossed both the fields of, of the arts and education, it was devastating last summer to find out that there was a Canadian educator who was bullied so badly by this ideology that he took his own life. His name was Richard Bilkstow. And I don't know if you read the uh, reporting by Rupa Supermania in the free press. Maybe you could link to it under this uh, article, under this video. But the enablers in that, that I think are just as bad 
as the so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion facilitator, who was the first person to go after him in this meeting. He, he again, like I was telling you before, I went to a training. Teachers have to go to trainings all the time. He was assigned to go to an online training about so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion. He very kindly asked a question because the facilitator was asserting that Canada is much more racist than the United States. And he gave an example showing how maybe Canada was not as racist as the United States. And she lit into him. And not only that, but his colleagues got on board. So then they were all piling onto him. We're all teachers. We're all in this because we're really excited about working with young people. We should all be on the same team. We should not be attacking each other. That facilitator goes, she called him the whiteness. She talked about getting out a weed whacker. These are adult professional educators. So this stuff has really gotten out of control. I don't know what possesses people to get on board with stuff like that. What possesses them to go after um, their colleagues in this manner? Um, you know, I'm grateful to be able to come on this podcast and talk to you about my experience because Richard Bilkso can't do that today. Mm. Yeah, I um, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Richard uh, when I was working at at Fair. Um, you know, for for our viewers, um, I, I made a I uh, produced a video with Kevin uh, about some of his story uh, when I was there. And uh, you know, I I talked to Richard about doing one with him about his story. Um, and you know, he, he was just so, he was so nice and, and he wanted to do it, but, um, you know, he was just so afraid of, of the impact because of the extreme stress of, of what he was going through up there and, and, you know, the attempts to, to destroy his career. And, um, yeah, that was, that was a really horrible, uh, thing to hear about. So it just goes to show it just goes to show how, how serious this is. You know, this isn't people just out there with some wacky ideas that you can just ignore. And I think when you talk about, you know, older people looking at it, you know, like it's the 60s at the civil rights movement and they're, they were like back then, okay, yeah, you know, there's some crazy people out here who are trying to found, you know, the Republic of New Africa, you know, and then secede five, you know, Southern states from the United States. But if that's not like the main thing that's going on, you know, the main thing that's going on is, uh, um, you know, Martin Luther King. And when you have all these people, you know, pushing for justice, yeah, you're going to have some crazies. And what they're not realizing about this moment is that it's this moment's led by the crazies. <laughs> and it's it's the it's the more moderate, more liberal people who are the exception to the rule, uh, the exception to the rule rather than the rule. Um like they were back then. I think, I think this is something that's, I mean, it's been building ever since then. It's entrenched itself in academia. Um, but I also think, you know, it, it's a function of social media and the internet in a big way where people are entering these, these kind of little cults or echo chambers where they just think this is normal. Like they have a community of people around them who just all see this as normal. And so when they're faced with people who disagree with them, who don't see this as normal, it's not it's not like, oh, I have to try to convince you or something like that. It's like you're evil because there's this community that I'm a part of that like we all get it. So why don't you why don't you get it? Um, I, I think that's a part of what's going on. Yeah, group think abounds. And um, it's unfortunate because particularly in the arts where it is generally a culture that flourishes with genuine diversity of thought and tolerance of different modes of thinking and exploring. I mean, that's what has made um, American art culture so great in previous decades was that there was so much um, freedom to explore and to push the boundaries. Anyway, so yeah, the thing that I think is beautiful about your story and why we wanted to share it, um, two things. You 
pushed back against this. You did not become one of the enablers. You chose to stand by your principles and um, I guess go with kind of your gut at first. I, I wonder how much that was a sense that you just kind of felt that this was not what it seems. I know a lot of us didn't know what critical social justice was when we first encountered it. We just encountered these ideas and these ways of being that seemed really authoritarian, mean, uh, discriminatory. And later on, once you learn about what is it that these people are talking about, then you realize, oh, this is actually an ideology that they're pushing. It's not just some kind of like, oh, personal opinion, or this is actually what anti-racism has always been. What are you talking about? How do you not know this? You're the one that's behind the times. It is its own ideology. So you had the wherewithal to push back on what is becoming kind of the status quo in a lot of places, in, in the arts, in education, in different fields. And I'd love to know how that journey went for you, because that's very hard for many people to break out of what you describe, those many different reasons why people just either don't say anything or find reasons not to say something and become an enabler of these really destructive ideas. Um, part of that has, I wrote in the essay that I went to graduate school twice. Um, the first time I went to graduate school, that degree the foundational text of that degree was Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and Augusto Boal's Theater of the Oppressed. So between 2008 and 2011, I had done a certain amount of work looking at how do you incorporate Paolo Freire's ideas and Augusto Boal's ideas into a theater practice where you go and you work with children, community members, um, using theater for some specific purpose, whether that's theater for education or theater for some kind of community event. Um, so I knew about pedagogy of the oppressed. And I saw, um, I don't know if you remember um, Evergreen State College and the meltdown that happened at Evergreen State College, but I remember watching that and hearing some of the things they were saying, and I went, oh, this is pedagogy of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. They're actually do, they're, it, 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 when I was in graduate school the first time, it was more of a theoretical. I mean, we did go back to it, but they weren't forcing us to do it. And people weren't, you know, having protests and shutting down the campus using this language. But as I was watching those videos, I was hearing what they're saying, and I'm like, that's, that's pedagogy of the oppressed. Um, also, uh, Coddling of the American Mind came out in 2018. Um, so that helped me understand what was going on. Um, I recently was talking to somebody um, back in December, and that person said to me, Wow, Kevin, you know that book you told me about, Coddling of the American Mind? That really seems to be coming true, isn't it? <laughs> And just for people that don't know, Coddling of the American Mind, book by Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist, and uh, Greg Lukianoff, the head of the foundation for uh, individual, they renamed it. Fire. Fire. Anyway, <laughs> thefire.org. Foundation Fuck for, for Individual Rights and Expression. Yeah, yeah there right. we go. Good. <laughs> anyway, great organization. Look them up. Donate. Great place. It's a book about, um, you know, how... Colleges and, you know, colleges and universities are teaching students the wrong stuff. They're teaching them that everything is about feelings. Um, they're teaching them to be angry all the time. Um, you know, you were saying before, you know, art is supposed to be pushing boundaries. This era of art is so conformist. <laughs> you know exactly what you're going to see when you go to a show these days. Because it's all the same conformist stuff because these young actors think if they don't put up this conformist ideology, they're a bad person. Yeah. They've been told they're bad people because their arts training is not about skills acquisition. Their arts training is not about taking risks. Their arts training is not about how do you collaborate with other artists. Their arts training is about identity and feelings. I was on campus directing a show 
in the fall of 2021, mainly because most theater professionals were just so afraid to go anywhere near a campus because of COVID. And I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity <laughs> to get on a campus and work with some college students. It was so hard. I mean, first of all, they wanted to create a show about loneliness. And I thought this is really fascinating because this generation of people is more connected than ever. They're mm -hmm. so connected by their phone, but even they understand they are lonely, that the phone is not a substitute. Mm -hmm. So they're telling me they want to devise a show about loneliness. And so we started working on that. Then they would come up to me on breaks or before or after rehearsal and tell me things like, well, you know, Kevin, we got one of our professors fired because she was a racist. Oh. And I go, in my head, I'm thinking, I'm sure I know exactly what happened. Yeah. This person said something. They took it as racist. They reported it. They got fired. That happened twice. Then the third time they came up to me, they said, well, Kevin, you know, we got one of our teachers fired because she was a capitalist. Oh, my God. Oh, so wait, wait, hold on. This one, this one I have to ask. Oh. How, what happened there? And they said, well, you know, we're acting students. And they made us take a design class. And for the design class, the teacher told us we had to buy art supplies. Meanwhile, let me just tell you, this is a private college, Okay. They've got enough money to buy art supplies. Um, the teacher told us we needed to buy art supplies. And I said, well, hold on for a second. The college didn't provide, the college had no resources if you needed to get art supplies. They go, well, I mean, the, the teacher told us that she had art supplies and we could use them, but her supplies weren't good. Oh my God. And they got her fired That's for absurd. being a capitalist. I mean, this behavior is unbelievable. And these are these were acting students. They, um, at one point, again, they started talking about power this, power that, mm -hmm. and movies and power. And I said, hey, because uh, a story had just broken and I forgot who it was. I forget who this celebrity was. There was a celebrity who had to apologize to China because this celebrity said something... Yes, John Sonino yeah. said something positive about Taiwan. Yeah. <laughs> so it was around that time. And these actors were saying, Hollywood and American power and it's oppressive. And I said, are Hollywood movies made just for Americans? Well, yes. I said, really? Um, there's you, you, you don't think there's any market in other countries around the world like, say, China? <laughs> Do you know what just happened with this person who had to apologize do you, has it occurred to you that maybe every movie made that is a big budget movie is also cleared so that it can be shown in the Chinese market? You don't think that's oppression? You don't think that's censorship? We've got adults working with college age students have got to get to a point where you stand up to these young people and say, I hear what you're saying. There is more to the story and let's look at that but they have to stop cowering and also feeding their anxiety. Mm. These young people are so anxious. Adults who are the adults in the room have to support them to get over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know what? That's, I think where we're meeting a lot of problems is that a lot of the adults in the room don't seem to have the wherewithal to be the adults in the room. And, you know, when you have something like that, where students are reporting professors um, for very flippant things, and then the administration is siding with the students, you know, you have a dysfunctional pattern there. And so I, I really just think it's, it's going to be this breaking point um, where these things just don't work because that kind of mechanism of I'm going to get professors fired for the slightest thing, the turnaround for professors is going to become untenable for universities. There are breaking points for all of this. And the theater has seen that. You um, have seen that yourself where there's been uh, dwindling audiences or issues with you know losing talent. And then the activists that come in don't actually stay for that long. They come in, do damage, and then move on to something else because they're not really that dedicated to the field. 
they're more dedicated to the ideology. I wrote about that situation with the the NYPD officer mm-hmm. who was trying to have his his show developed and the audience screaming. And I knew that artistic director. And mm-hmm. after it was over, I walked right up to that artistic director and I said, I had no idea I was going to be a participant in the public shaming when I bought a ticket for this event. It didn't land on her what I was saying mm-hmm. to her. All that she came out with was, well, there were some things he needed to hear. <laughs> it didn't land on her that she just manipulated and used her own audience mm-hmm. without telling them. That was a terrible thing to do. That artistic director has left the field. Mm-hmm. That artistic director has moved on to another field entirely. Mm-hmm. This is also why I get really upset when I have people telling me that I need to step aside mm-hmm. because of some identity characteristic. I've been involved in theater my whole life. I'm 51. But because you've discovered Robin D'Angelo yeah. and you're 28 years old, you think you're in a position to tell me I need to step aside? It's astonishing. It really, I mean, it's really the way people are treating each other. It's, it's, it's just astonishing over this ideology. Yeah. And to recap that uh, story that's in the essay with the police officer, I don't know, um, since people may not have read that, I'd like to add some more details because that story was just really disturbing to me. Um, It was a police officer who took interest in theater as a way to express his stories from his life, you know, his lived experience, as some might appreciate. And, um, but not that lived experience. That's not the kind of lived experience that was being looked for by social justice activists in the theater. So apparently, perhaps there was a handful of complaints of people that were not happy with um, the police officer's story. I guess he's adapting stories from his experience as an officer, which you can imagine is fairly uh, intense. It's a common, um, there, there is a style of theater making where it's kind of like a, a person a person goes on stage and talks about mm-hmm. a, a specific event in their life or their whole life and they're recounting what happened to that. This police officer had had experience before telling episodes from his own life. This is not in the essay, and I think it's sort of important to say, when you're trying to get work as a theater director, the advice you get all the time is network. Go network. Go network. Go talk to people. Network. Go talk to people. Network. Go talk to people. So I knew the artistic director at this theater, and this theater was doing a rare thing, which was it was showcasing works in development that started with a director as opposed to works in, de- in development that started with a playwright. So I thought, oh, they've got a director's program. I should go to that. I should say hi to the artistic director and if possible say I'd be definitely interested in participating in something like this. If the opportunity ever arose. This, is, this was the second night of the event. So there had been a a Friday night. I think this was Saturday. I was sitting in the audience next to strangers. The first 10-minute thing comes up on the stage, it leaves. The second 10-minute thing comes up on stage, it leaves. The third 10-minute thing is this bald middle-aged man standing center stage and a young woman very far away from him downstage. And at at first I thought, oh, this could be interesting. (laughs) Maybe this is like some hyper-realistic talk-to-the-audience type thing. Because at first I couldn't follow what she was saying. And this this young director was saying, I got a lot of emails last night about things that were said as part of the performance. This person also said something like, you know, I graduated with my MFA in theater directing and that's really expensive and I have student loans to pay back. And so when my agent called to um, help this person turn um, his memoir into a performance, you know, I accepted the offer. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, okay. And then it just starts to go on into this story about how what was said to the night before was harmful to the audience. It hurt people. It offended people. And then people who had been at the performance the night before started standing up, yelling at this police officer. It, it sort of came out, oh, this was a police officer who's telling stories from his life. 
we weren't allowed to hear what those stories were. We have we, we couldn't judge for mm-hmm. ourselves. We were just being told what was said last night was so offensive and so hurtful, it couldn't be staged again. And then people are confronting him, standing up, yelling at him. And then his wife was in the audience. And then she stood up and she was like, my husband is a good man. He fought for the city on 9-11. They didn't want to hear any of that. They didn't care. I, I remember there was something like, the police officer was like, look, if I see somebody running down the street with a gun as an officer, I have to pursue it. They were like, how dare you not take the person's race into account and think maybe you shouldn't follow that person because of running oppression. With a gun. I mean, oh my gosh, we're that's in just a that theater. kind of medi- motivated reasoning where he has no chance and it's a struggle session essentially set up to make him into an effigy of everything that's wrong with police and race and here's the culmination of why our critical social justice ideas are so needed. Let's he hatred on this individual trying to use art to express himself. How dare he do that? And that's really what gets punished there, right? There's no actual attempt to problem solve or say, hey, maybe there, maybe this illustrated some problems with policing that could be addressed in an actually constructive manner. Rather, it's how dare you just even express yourself in this regard. That's what gets punished. And that's why we end up with this kind of repressed, sanitized, fearful art culture where everything is extremely safe and the idea of what's pushing the boundaries is let's have a struggle session on stage. That's how we're going to push the boundaries. But actually considering, hey, here's someone's real experience as a police officer. I didn't like this. This was challenging. Wow, these are accounts of violence or whatever it might be that's upsetting the audience. Once upon a time, we understood as a culture, that's actually the value of art is that you're being confronted with something you don't normally get to hear, that maybe you don't like. And rather than reflect on that and say, I don't actually like that this is the way policing is working. What can I do to address that? I'm just going to shout down this person who represents that which I am against, not actually do anything. I just want to silence and punish those who represent what I disagree with. And if you have that kind of mentality in the arts, you can't make anything that anybody disagrees with because they throw tantrums and push the people out. And like you had this uh, 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 this art director, I believe is, is her title, putting the man up on stage. In, in my opinion, the correct thing to do there would be, I'm sorry you were offended. I'm happy to hear your ideas for what you would like to see in the theater, but I protect my artists and I protect their right to express themselves. I'll take your feedback into consideration, but the last thing I would do as someone that's like helping someone express their story is to put them up on stage to have a struggle session after the fact and try to like save face and be like, I just did this because I have student loans. I don't know. You know, it's really just a disgraceful scene. I mean, one of the things that gets, gets, you know, you have white privilege, you have male privilege, you have this privilege, you have that privilege. And then, yeah, we have this person coming out talking about how she went to an Ivy League right. school. You're like, what? Okay, so which, which day of the week is it? Like, <laughs> just to get back to what is critical social justice, is it anything other than temper tantrums, mm-hmm. really? Because the rules change all the exactly. time. It's whatever I want it to be, whichever day of the week. I think it was really exposed at those congressional hearings with the college and university professors, because mm-hmm. although technically their argument was correct, as far as it depends on the context, whether or not we can take action, blah, 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 blah. But that would be if they authentically believed in free speech, which we know that they do not. Harvard gave Carol Hoover a terrible time. Mm-hmm. Harvard did a horrible thing. I believe Roland Fryer was also at Harvard. They gave them a horrible time because of the things that they said. But now they're going to come up and say free speech. We know you don't believe in free speech because you change the rules based on who is the oppressor this week. Mm-hmm. So is this is this critical social justice really any kind of trustworthy academic field? Or is it just a weapon that we can use to get rid of anybody that we think we don't want this week? Mm-hmm. 
And if you do that to this group on Monday and you do it to that group on Tuesday, who's going to be left by Friday? Yeah, the most obedient only. <laughs> That's why I can't, I, I just have such a hard time understanding why a lot of my colleagues are not willing to stand up to this. This is going to come to you. I want to talk about that, the spread that is happening. Um, so you talk about how there's in the article that there's been dwindling attendance at theaters, um, that this has been terrible for the industry. What are you seeing now in terms of the shows that are being put out and audiences reactions to these political propaganda performances? So it's obfuscated because it's hard to know mm -hmm. what the reactions are, because particularly in New York and theater, the New York Times tells us what we're supposed to think about New York theater. Um, so it's hard to really know what people on the street are actually thinking about it. Um, and, you know, we're getting a lot of propaganda from the New York Times about what is good and what isn't good. And it's very moralistic. Um, I suspect a lot of attendance problems has to do with audiences being told off one one time too many. I mean, I, I went to a show that was done um, in an off-Broadway venue, and that show concluded with um, asking audience members who identified as white to come up and stand on the stage to understand that you don't own your seat <laughs> and to see what it's like to be surveilled all the time. And we were asked multiple times. And finally, I was like, all right, I'll go up. Just I just want to see what it's like. <laughs> I just want to see what's what's happening. So I walk up on the stage and then I look out into the audience and I see who's there. There was a young woman. And she was just bawling. Like she was just she was sitting in the audience. She was so upset. She was bawling. There was another man who um, also middle aged, maybe slightly older than me. He was white and he was sitting there like this, like. <laughs> then I saw people like storming out of the theater. They were so angry. Okay, you are correct. Nobody owns those seats, but they did pay you money to write a play to perform for them. And you want to tell them there's something bad about them, or you think there's something bad about them because of the color of their skin. They just paid you a lot of money if you want to address identity in some way or racism in some way, you have to reach their hearts and minds. I think one of the worst things that has happened in American theater is when the cast of Hamilton decided to cuss out the vice president of the United States. I didn't vote for Mike Pence. I don't like Mike Pence. Wasn't happy about any of that. But if you want to change Mike Pence's heart and mind, let him come and see your show. Yeah. Let him watch your show. Let him leave and let him have his thoughts. But don't publicly berate him because then he's not going to think about your show. You're not going to reach his heart and mind. Mm -hmm. You're going to make him resentful, as he should be by that behavior, which was childish mm -hmm. and ridiculous. But that is the same type of behavior that has um, gotten turned into generating plays that for, for an entire play you're sitting and dealing with that. These plays that are like, you know, shame the audience. Mm -hmm. I, I had colleagues in, the th in, in theater who would go see them. And then they'd walk up to me like either before a class or before a rehearsal. And they'd go, Kevin, have you seen Slave Play? You, re you really need to see Slave Play. Well, let me guess. There, there's a lesson in it that says I'm a bad person <laughs> Let me guess. That's the reason I did. That's the reason why you are coming up to me. I mean, it's all, it's very much like Jehovah's Witness. Right. Like, have you heard the good news? <laughs> have you heard the good news? That's and they, so the, and the thing is, they're relentless about it. They won't stop. Mm -hmm. And my point is, how are we going to rehearse a play if this is all we're going to do? Yeah. If we're going to have to distrust everybody's motivations over everything, how are we going to trust each other to take artistic risks in this room? Yeah. There's two things you mentioned there that it's just so interesting, uh, the contrast. So on the one hand, you have the person coming up to you telling you you need to sh see this show, right? 
And they are that sort of Jehovah's Witness, have you heard the word, right? And they're coming to you as a friend. They're coming to you nicely. You know, you know enough to roll your eyes at it a little. But, you know, for many people, that's a friendly message that works. And then that's contrasted with we're on stage, we're yelling at you, we're telling you you're bad, Mike Pence, or whoever. And, you know, that's not going to change anybody's mind. And, um, you know, I just love the the Daryl Davis example, who, again, I worked with at FAIR, and I just think is one of the most honorable people um, in the world uh, with, with the activism that he does, which is, you know, he goes to, he's a black man who goes to these white supremacists, and he goes as their friends, And, you know, he tries to change their mind through friendship and through kindness. And, you know, that's in contrast with this. We're going to yell at everybody. We're going to attack everybody. We're going to try to shut down everybody that we think is bad. And, you know, I think there can be a place for both of these sorts of tactics. But you have to understand when and where you're doing it, where, you know, if you're going to talk to Mike Pence or a conservative like that in that angry, hostile way, and you're a, a progressive who doesn't like conservatives, do you really think you're going to successfully get rid of all the conservatives from this country? Do you think you're going to get rid of the almost half the country that votes Republican? That's not going to work. So you it's much better to try to come to them in a way where, OK, we have to live together let's get along. If you want to do the other thing, if you want to do why I thought it was important to be long and to start all the way back oh, when I, you know, broke my neck and almost lost my life at eight years old was that I really wanted people to understand everybody has a life. Everybody has a story. We're three-dimensional human beings with thoughts, feelings, dreams that may have nothing to do with our identity. How dare anyone reduce people to You are a cisgender white man. How dare anyone do that? Mm -hmm. Maybe for um, statistical reporting, you need that demographic data. But how dare theater artists, how dare teachers bully each other over that? You don't know the first thing about what's happened to this person. You don't know that this person you're talking to is lucky to be standing up lucky to be alive and that, that that thought never crosses their mind because all they're thinking is Ibram X. Kendi told me that the only way to uh, address discrimination in the past is to discriminate in the present Ibram X. Kendi told me that he must be right when are they going to stop and take a look at what they're doing How many more people need to get fired over this stuff? 
you know, these were your, these were your friends. These were your artistic collaborators that show that, um, uh, by the police officer, that's a show we're never going to see. We're never going to see that show. Um, how many, how many young artists are not going into the arts anymore? Because it used to be, if you went into the arts, it was because you wanted to act like a different person. Mm -hmm. It was because you wanted to learn about how to be on stage. It was because you wanted to learn about how to make a film and what makes a great shot and what are all the different shots. But now the message young people are getting is if you want to be in the arts, you better be hyper-focused on feelings and identity and creating work that shames people who aren't like you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Jake, on your point about conservatives, well, there's a lot of conservatives that have money. Um, I, I think, uh, I think it, I, somebody said this recently, but they were like, everybody's money is green. <laughs> so nobody's stopping you from doing your show but if you're going to make it so that you intentionally do it so those people don't come I thought you wanted to hire artists to work with you I thought you wanted actors to get insurance if you're going to alienate the audience by being intentionally cruel to them well yeah then it shouldn't be a surprise that Ticket sales are low. It shouldn't be a surprise that theaters are closing. We, I quoted in that article, there was um, somebody who I believe worked on a board and she flat out said, well, if we lose some audience members, mm -hmm. I guess we're okay with that. <laughs> yeah. Fast forward to now. How okay are they now? Well, are you okay with it now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to your point, um, remember that critical social justice teaches us that pursuing excellence and mastery is also another facet of white supremacy. So more important to scold your audience than it is to actually make good art, which I will say this until the day I die, is the real way to change society and culture if that's truly what you want, is to, like you said, change hearts and minds it's not by having a tantrum and lashing out at people. It's by actually doing something good that moves people, which is why art is such a great vehicle for that. But not if you put expressing your ideology above actually making good art. But you actually did survive that. You've stayed working, I guess now in two ways. So you are still working as a teaching artist, which is wonderful. But then two, now you are a theater director. You are making great work. So I want to ask two two last questions. And then I, I know we've, we've taken a lot of your time, which is number one, how did you make it through? You know, how did you succeed in this hostile environment? And then since you have, you know, I've, I've seen one of your shows, but I know you're working on a new one. What is the work that you're you're doing um, now? You know, with with the career that you you've managed to provide for yourself, despite all the the obstacles of the the politics of this industry. Again, on, on the subject of collaboration, I was lucky in that I was able to get uh, into a, a public graduate school program here in New York City, where I met some really great collaborators. I met a lot of actors. I met a lot of wonderful designers. So I had other artists I could turn to to say, would you be interested in working with me on something now that college is over? So I was really lucky um, to have that company. Um, and because we knew each other, um, I think, you know, we didn't have to start that process with all this Stuff. A lot of times rehearsals now, they'll put up like a laundry list of rules that everybody has to agree, like community agreements. We didn't have to do that stuff because we all knew each other. Um, it also partly came because I know that I want to make theater. And my thought was either you could whine and cry and you can say, the critical social justice activists, they won't let me in. They won't let me participate. They won't let me. It's all them. Or you could try to make your own work in whatever way you can. So I am making work. I am not supporting myself financially by making that work. I am doing it because I really want to make this type of art. I really want to be with these collaborators in a room working on something together. Um, 
I have always enjoyed reading since I was a, a young person. Um, I had experience doing what's called devised theater, which is creating theater in a room with other people um, based on a story or an event or an article or a painting, which is a different than when a playwright goes away and writes a play by themselves. And then they show up and they say, here's the play, everybody perform it. We create the play in the room and the, the last two productions and this upcoming one are both based on um, fiction that's in the public domain. I really like experimenting with theatricality. I like it when there's a story that has something in it that when you read it, you think, how in the world are we going to put this on stage? The first show we did was um, an adaptation of some ghost stories by Edith Wharton. And I thought, oh, this is really exciting. How do you put a ghost on stage in a way that makes the audience feel a sense of fear? Like we could do ghost in a very corny way, or we could do ghost in a, but, but, but how do you do that thing that, you know, Alfred Hitchcock was really great at, at, at suggesting things and making you imagine it worse than it actually is. So it was just fun to experiment both with Edith Wharton stories, but also how we use fog and lighting and costumes and scenic pieces. And then the second piece we did was an adaptation of a short story by Ian Forrester called The Machine Stops, which um, takes place in the future. And it had a lot of elements in it that were um, just challenging to figure out how do you stage it. The people in that community were living in a future Earth and they were all underground. They were all being told a lie that the surface of the Earth was dead. And one of the characters goes from underground to above ground. And of course, we don't have any money to build a set that somebody could climb and, and go on top of. So we had to figure out how to theatrically let that character take that journey. And luckily, um, one of my collaborators is a puppetry artist. And so uh, puppetry worked with projections to create this way of doing the whole thing in shadow and projections to suggest to the audience something that was happening that didn't really happen, right? The person didn't lit climb a literal set that had different levels, but we tried to express it theatrically. Um, I really enjoy material that is not about, that, that doesn't take place in the here and now. It's more enjoyable for me for something, it took place long ago and far away, or it took place in an imagined future because that way we can metaphorically address issues and let the audience draw their own conclusions. There was a production that was done here in New York City of Julius Caesar, and the director decided to make the cast look like it was um, Julius Caesar was dressed and acted like Donald Trump and the other people were like, you know, in the Trump world. And I'm like, do you think the audience is that dumb? Do you think the audience if you did a production of Julius Caesar right after the election of Trump, that they wouldn't, even if you did it in like all Roman garb, you think the audience wouldn't go, huh, there's some similarities and differences to what's happening in our politics right now. But no, they have to, there, there's always this impulse when um, people adapt things to go, oh, and we're going to adapt it to now. Mm -hmm. Well, there's advantages and disadvantages to things being now. When things are now, it's right here in our, it's hard to have any perspective. And it's hard to reach hearts and minds if you want to talk about some of the serious social issues we're dealing with. If the characters look like, you know, they're people we see every day. But if it's characters from long ago or characters that are in the imagined future, we can let that go and go on the journey of what's happening with these characters, what's happening in their world, who wants to get what are they getting at, what are the thematic issues. So I'm having a really good time. I'm adapting... Um, we just started rehearsals adapting a novel by a Russian dissident named Yevgeny Zamyatan. Um, the novel. First book banned by the Soviet Union. It was originally published in English in 1924 because it couldn't be published in Russia. George Orwell read We and gave it a a so so review. And then he used a lot of the plot elements of We to write 1984. 
So if you were to read We in 1984, you'll notice a lot of, of similarities, but also a lot of differences too, which is which is really exciting. This has been so enlightening and hopeful. I think the thing about this is that it's hopeful to hear your story and what you're doing despite pushing back on what to some people and especially to some artists is a really depressing turn in the arts. It's really sad to see the state of the arts um, be gripped so much by this kind of like narrow mindedness. And it's hopeful to see that there are artists like you who are still pursuing genuine artistry and free expression in a way that um, inspires audiences and expands the way we see things as opposed to very narrowly tells us, here's what to think. So that's just a great thing. And I'm, I'm very grateful that we've been able to talk to you. It is a difficult time. It would, it would be wonderful if I could do this work at a theater where we had institutional support so we could pay everybody what they're worth and we work, but that's not on offer right now. Mm -hmm. So the reality is, yes, they can call you all kinds of names. Yes, they can close the doors and say you can't come in, but they can't take your mind and they can't take your heart. And if you have real friends who want to collaborate with you, they can't take that either. Mm -hmm. So call up your friends, sit down with everybody, say, does anybody have an idea? Let's try it out. Let's try it. Let's make something. I mean, you know, an example everybody would know, when George Lucas was making Star Wars, everybody thought he was out of his mind. <laughs> when he's filming Star Wars in, in, in the UK, the, the UK crew was laughing at him with those, they were like, what is, it? What is this thing? This is a mess. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's always going to be difficult to make art. We, yeah. we just happen to be at a, at a particular time where, um, you know, it's, everything's directed at people's identities. They're trying to do something that is both sociological and psychological. What I find scary is the way that they're trying to get inside your head. Mm -hmm. The way that, you know, Robin D'Angelo in particular, it's, it's sort of like faux self-help and trying to get inside people's heads to kind of almost reprogram mm -hmm. them. But maybe this is also an instance of like difficult times reveals to us who we are. Would I, would I, you know, and I said at the end of the essay, so th this would be a good place to wrap up. I, I owe them thanks in a way. Right. Because I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be doing this without without this obstacle. Had I not broke my neck, I might not be here. You know, had not any of the things that happened to me in life. But this particular thing not only, you know, forced me to find a way to make work, but is also putting me in a position to think, well, what do you want to make work about? And how do you respond to the moment without it being like right on the nose, this is what it is. I wrote in the essay about, you know, the parallels between ghost stories, which are always about transgressions from the past reappearing in the present. Well, that's very similar to what Ibram X. Kendi said, past discrimination and present discrimination. Well, let's see what audiences think about that in a different context. And then at the end of the show, I didn't, you know, quiz them. Well, what did you think? I let them leave the theater and I let them make their own decisions. Maybe they thought the show was boring or maybe they thought it was interesting or maybe they just thought it was scary or maybe it did make them think about that topic. I, I, I'm not there to control that. What I am there to do is to try to make the best artwork that I can make in a way that I enjoy almost all of it. Yes. You know, there, there's always a, a part of art making that's, you know, stressful and yeah. it's a struggle and, and nobody enjoys it but the majority of it because i can set the rules i can say this is what we're working on i can say this is who we're working with no theater no theater is going to come down here and say kevin you better start doing pronouns right now mm -hmm. kevin you better start incorporating race and racism conversations into every rehearsal right now they can't do that to me so in some ways it's a gift yeah, yeah, I think you're so right. And one of the things that often makes art great is some kind of obstacle. 
because it forces you to be a little more creative, whether that's just simply a technical obstacle in that you lack a certain tool or you lack funding or you lack some mechanism by which to make something happen. That is often what births creativity. So in some ways, this is a great time for artists who are willing to take that black sheep route and do what they want to do on their own and critics and activists be damned, which I think is something that you've done. And it's really inspiring to see that. And your essay resonated with so many people, which is also inspiring to see. So I would just like to wrap up with asking you if there's any way that people want to get in touch with you or follow your work or if they have any ideas for how they can connect you with some funding, anything that would be um, in that realm that uh, they might want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? I think the essay links to links for things. Like I think that doesn't, if you click on my profile in Substack, I think it links to Kevin Ray works, which is my website. Um, and Kevin Ray works on Instagram. I, um, or I, I guess you can't you can't message people in some stack. I don't think right. Um, I did you know I will say um, again I was surprised anybody read it. I really I was I was really shocked. I thought <laughs> this article is too long. Nobody's going. So it was really <laughs> yeah. exciting. Not only that people read it, but I had people reach out to me. Um, you know, private messages on Instagram. That's great. Um, emails um, with really encouraging things to say. So that's, that's a way. And, you know, the other thing is that it's, it's so great that without this, I wouldn't have had a chance to meet you two. Yeah, oh. that's true. So <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to know you guys. And, and oh. I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm so happy for you that you're doing this. I'm so proud of you for doing this. It's daring to come up with publications where you're going to print a whole bunch of different perspectives. They might be things that people disagree with, but put it out there. let Put it out there. Well, thank you. My perspectives are really making people not like me right now. So, <laughs> so <laughs> he embodies the black sheep. So I, they should not like if they don't like your perspective. That's okay. They don't yeah. have to like your perspective. That's yeah. different than not liking you. Exactly. I like you. Oh well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Kevin. Thank you so much. I don't think there is a chat feature on Substack yet. But yes, go to Kevin's website. Um, I'm so glad that you got those positive comments. It is the most yeah, well successful deserved. article that we've published to date by um, Engagement Metrics. And so, you know, I just think it's a wonderful piece. We're so proud to have been a part of it. We're so proud to um, been able to talk to you today. Uh, for viewers who don't already follow us at The Black Sheep, we theblacksheep.com. Uh, we are also on social media, and this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, all of which are at WT Black Sheep. Um, so please follow us as well. And uh, thank you so much, and we hope to see you soon. Make good art. Make things. Go forth and make things. <laughs>